and everybody you meet can teach you something that you don't know. No matter if it's a child or a 78 year old, who knows where they live? You know, everybody has something to share that, that you don't know. Welcome to Create a Putzba. My name is Leonard Samuels. I'll be co-hosting with Rico Nizal, where we'll be interviewing artists and business owners in the world of creative. We hope you enjoy. Thank you for watching Creative Chutzpah. Hope you enjoyed it. I think you did. I saw a few smiles over there. All right. And make sure you turn into Rico Nizal's Creative Leadership with Heart. All right. He's pretty good. Okay. Give him a chance too. All right. And uh, we'll see you next time. And make sure you notch on something. You're too skinny. You're too skinny. Get out there and eat. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of Creative Chutzpah. I am your host, Rico Nizal, and your co-host, Leonard Samuels. And today... We have Sally Montana, a photographer and director who owns her own independent creative business. So, Sally, thank you for joining the show. Welcome. And thank jumping, you. Thank you. Yeah, jumping right in. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey as a creative. What That's is it about long... creative industry that that got you in, excited about it? That's a, that's a long journey. I started my um, career in photography in 1997. So... 20, I don't know how many years ago, 27 years ago. Oh my goodness. Um, I had in seventh grade, we had a school project where we um, were supposed to stage our favorite music video. And two friends of mine and I, we teamed up and we staged Queen, I'm going slightly mad. I did the camera and they did the acting. And I was at 17, I was immediately hooked and I wanted to be a camera woman. And coming out of high school two years later, um, I was trying to get internships at any kind of film studios in Germany. I, mind you, I grew up in a 1500 people town. In, holy cow. In holy cow. Yeah, small town, <laughs> big secrets. Yes, yeah. very, very rural area. So I couldn't get um, an internship anywhere until a friend of mine approached me and said, hey, this might not be exactly what you want, but I know a photo studio who's looking for an intern. Um, and so I started doing that. And after six months, I loved it so much. They loved me so much. They said, okay, we're going to offer you a three-year contract to do an apprenticeship. And the rest is kind of history. I It was a very technical apprenticeship. I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to cover a little bit more of a creative aspect um, after that. So I moved to Zurich and I started studying the arts aspect of photography at the Zurich University of the Arts. Um, did a year long um, exchange with the University of Cape Town in South Africa. That was very eye opening. The Nicola School of Fine Arts. Yeah, I'm all about the traveling. Yeah. Um, and came back to Switzerland and started assisting and started doing my own jobs and and eventually transitioned into just being a photographer until the itch got me again and I started applying for the green card lottery and serendipity if you will in 2011 um, I was selected in the green card lottery and within a year and a half I moved to New York oh wow and that was a complete reset so yeah it's a it's been a journey <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've been, you've seen a lot while. So from Germany to Cape Town to Switzerland to the United States. Yeah. I'm, I'm well, sure there's Switzerland some in there. Germany, Switzerland, Cape Town, oh, Switzerland, US. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what was it about those places? What was it about, you know, you grew up in a small town, right? So of course, maybe getting more exposure outside of that. What what brought you to, why Cape Town? Why New York? What, what was it about those areas that made you want to participate in the creative scene that was happening there? Well, Cape Town came about because um, I was assisting a photographer in Switzerland and he managed to um, get a job that took us to Cape Town for an entire month, um, shooting still live, no less. <laughs> It was the it was the Switzerland winter, and he only used daylight, so he sold the client that we would have to go to Cape Town around the world to shoot whatever they were um, in need of. And I fell in love with what they call the mother city, and I just I wanted to come back. So um, it was 
University of Cape Town was really interesting because it's, I started learning Swahili. I started learning about, you know, South African photo history. I started collaborating there with local students. It was just traveling is eye opening. And that's, that's kind of my, my theme. And then New York, I was selected for the green card lottery while I was on a six month road trip across the US. Um, I wanted to do a project about Americans. Um, so I bought a, I bought an SUV and I slept in the truck and I traveled six months across the US. And while I was in Washington state, I received the notification that I was selected. And I thought, this is so interesting. I can look at all of the states to figure out a place where I want to live. But I think ultimately I always knew that it was going to be New York because that's what makes or breaks you. If you make it there, you make it anywhere, right? That, that saying holds true. And that's where for me, the center of the photo inter industry was at the time. By now I've settled over, moved over to LA. Yeah, well, you, you did van life before van life was a thing, I guess. Yeah, I was just gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I'm sure you saw saw and took a lot of amazing photos along the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that that being said, like, what is it about creative? Like, what is your personal mission? What is the thing that, like, what do you see? Maybe this is a better question for a photographer. What do you see through the lens that Ooh. keeps you doing it? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I see people. And I think based on my traveling background, it's, there's, it traveling just broadens your horizon so much that it's easy to see how everybody comes in with a different mindset, a different cultural background, a different approach of how to do things. And everybody you meet can teach you something that you don't know. No matter if it's a child or a 78 year old, who knows where they live, you know, everybody has something to share that that you don't know. And it's the storytelling, um, first and foremost, the, the meeting people, the sharing stories, uplifting people, sharing, you know, the stuff that I do with my rodeo work is I focus not on what a lot of other photographers focus on, the rides themselves and the perfect picture of the cowboy on the bucking horse. I focus on the backstage, the cowboys getting ready, the you know the anxiety that's in the air and the tension. Yeah. So that's what I'm. That's what I'm really after. You're almost capturing two different people when you're getting the backstage and then the performance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and you're you're actually getting, you're exposing to people the people like the reality of what it's like to do that. Because what is the movie Eight Seconds? You get eight seconds yeah. to see them on a horse, but you don't see the hours, years, days, even minutes yeah. before. Is this a that. movie called Eight Seconds? Yes. Oh, it is was it like a or what? It's oh, so no. interesting that you bring that up. Okay, so here's the backstory to that. But this is we are talking about serendipity and opportunity. So <laughs> so two years ago I went to um my first my first rodeo and I just had tickets for the for the event but i didn't know anything it was a gut decision to leave one day to the next and i just had my canvas and my camera and i walked up to the back gate kind of lingering around trying to figure out how to where to set up and whatnot and this older gentleman walks up to me and he says hi i'm john Brownie." i'm like hi i'm sally montana he's like where have we met and we just connected instantly and um he said come here come backstage so to speak and set up your cameras and he started wrangling the cowboys for me and said okay here's Dwayne Cody whatever their names are get your photo taken and everybody told me he's um rodeo royalty and I was like what like what do you mean and they were like well do you know the movie eight seconds which is a movie about a legendary bull named Red Rock who had 309 rides over, I think, three years where no cowboy was able to stay on for eight seconds. And in 1988, this cowboy Lane Frost had his first ride of eight seconds. And this guy who let me in at the rodeo owned the bull Red Rock in the 1990s. So that was that was my moment of serendipity. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
You know, I'm very curious uh, because you're coming from uh, Germany and you come to the States. Like, what is it about the rodeo and the cowboy life that just like sings to your, to your bluegrass heart? <laughs> <laughs> well, I grew up. You capture it so well, which is yeah. the, the ironic part about it for like some people that live in the States. Yes, you're just saying like, we want to capture the, the bull riding and this and that, but you're capturing the human aspect. Thank you. Of it. It's, it started off because I, I had a difficult moment in my life and I felt like I wanted to be grounded. And I said, um, you know what, I need to get my boots in the dirt and I, you know, I need to be with animals to just center myself. And a friend said, go to a rodeo. And it just drew me in the serendipity and rodeos the rodeos are a lot of fun. If anybody has not but, been to a rodeo, they are fun. Yes, they are fun. They are a lot of fun for sure. So you um yeah, our theme is serendipity and opportunity. And the one thing I want to go back to is, you know, it sounded like you had a lot of opportunities to do certain things. Were there ever blockers of resistance? To taking was there ever say like i gotta go to cape town but i have all these other things or did you look at everything as an opportunity to take advantage of it like how did you approach your career so far um it was pretty much a if it's not in the right time if the gut feeling isn't right then it is not the right thing um when i applied for art school a lot of my friends asked okay, so you applied for Zurich, which has a 10% acceptance rate. What are you going to, like, what's your backup plan? What's your plan B if you don't get accepted? And I said, I don't have a backup plan. It's, that's where I'm going to go. <laughs> all or nothing. And I, all or nothing. And it, I think that was the de determination was part of it, right? And for the, for example, for the green card lottery, I think I applied over the course of seven years and i always said i'll be selected when the time is right in my life when i have either a partner who's willing to move with me or if i'm not in a relationship and if my photography is advanced enough to sustain myself and that's how it happened so for you thinking about those things what what did success look like for you in those moments and how has that, if it has, changed for you now? Well, in the I want to say in the beginning, when I first started off as a teenager, success was a lot of escapism from improving myself to a critical father. Um, you know, like many people do. Mm -hmm. um, I think we all I know wanted, that well. I know that well. Yeah, right. It's a that's a shared experience of many people. Um, as a teenager, I always wanted to travel for work. Um, and then when I started assisting, I worked with this photographer who traveled a lot for work. Um, and those were my role models. So that was, that was my, for a very long time, my definition of success. And that's what I live these days. And as I have that, and as I grow more into who I am, and more self-aware success for me is to have a work life and a personal life that I don't need to escape from like that who I need to go on vacation I need a time out for two weeks I don't want to have that you know um and another aspect of success for me is to uplift other people you know everybody has someone who helped them up the ladder and I think as people climb up the ladder, they should help the next person who's coming after them up, right? Make and it you're entertainment. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Well, there's a that's what are these words you're saying? Aspect of success, it's like that thrill and the challenge of you have everything honed in, and you get five minutes, seven minutes, three minutes with talent. That's a different Sometimes story. Eight seconds, right? Sometimes eight seconds, exactly. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> so there, there was a uh, something really important you said there, and I think super in like what people try to aspire to, and is that 
you you don't have to take vacations to escape from anything. So for people who don't know what that feels like or how to create that, what does that mean for you? How have you created that for yourself? Ooh, I want to say it ties into the early escapism. I always pick projects, personal projects that took me somewhere. I did um, a project about there's this town in Pennsylvania, Centralia, that has an underground mine fire going on since 1962, and it's still burning. Um, I did a story about a death row inmate in Idaho, all while I still lived in Switzerland. And so those were my vacation trips with a purpose, because I also needed some solitude. And that kind of morphed into a balance. I don't, very spotlight yeah. projects. Um, are you planning on like maybe highlighting these, you know, these things more? I'd, I'd say like a coffee table book. <laughs> I don't know how appealing a coffee table book of that would be, but <laughs> <laughs> working well, with a okay. journalist and and uh, putting stuff together. Um, I think the the topics I pick, I still find interesting, yeah. but my photography has changed so much um and my approaches to projects has changed so much in the last even just five years not to mention you know 10 or 15 years so if i look at the photos i still like them but i keep thinking oh, i could do this better i could do that better or i would do that differently you know it's like just cover more ground instead you know while I was doing these in my escapism mindset, I was very focused on, okay, I need to achieve this. I need to achieve that. So ultimately some of my, I don't really want to call them regrets, but some of the things I would do differently is cover more aspects and be less focused on the 10 key pictures that I want to get. But at the same time, you know, you're in a different country, you're dealing with solitude, you're feeling lonely, you're, you know, you have to do everything yourself. You have to call the director of the prison to ask for a photo. And everything takes so much energy that I had to really just curl up into that solitude that at the time I did the best I could. But I don't, I think if I were to do a coffee table book these days, it would be about rodeo. Because <laughs> yeah. this is a really a project that I feel like, okay, this is, this is where I want to be in my storytelling. So that's interesting, right? You said if you look back now, you still like some of them, but it's evolved. How how have you evolved, and how has the industry in general evolved? And like, how would you keep up with it? I think the industry has changed a lot. Like back in the days in the '90s when I did my apprenticeship in Germany, they, you know, a there was more money um for productions than these days and people would start their day with a bottle of prosecco <laughs> and then slowly get started and you know the clients <laughs> roll in at 10 or 11 and it's very you know easy easy peasy um i think the um the industry has especially in the last five years evolved to a lot more diversity which i think is great um i remember in 2001 i was assisting in munich and i was working with this photographer who got a, a production for marlboro and we were supposed to travel to wyoming for two weeks and photograph for marlboro and ultimately the client called him and said you need to take a male photo assistant because a female photo assistant is going to distract the cowboys too much. And so I don't remember if I was confirmed at the time, but it was it was such a disappointment. And I can't really imagine this would happen um, that way at this point. Um, but we still have a long way to go. I, I did a list the other day about photographers and entertainment, and they're like maybe 31-ish, 32 bigger names who do um, the major shoots. And 23 of those are men and nine of those are women. And then you have two black men in there. And, it's, and the majority is white men. And it's 
I don't want to bash this, but I would like for the doors to open more and be more inclusive to that. Yeah, because you're besides from doing a lot of the lifestyle shoots and all these, uh, I don't want to say really important shoots because they are really important and not to take away from the entertainment because that's also important. <laughs> but I know that you also do entertainment shoots, like the big Hollywood production uh, level shoots yeah. for, uh, I think you did something for Stars uh, not too yes. long ago. I did Blind Spotting season yeah. two for Stars. I did Miss Marvel for Disney. That was one of my first big, um, big photo shoots. I yeah. did Criminal Minds recently and Seal Team for Paramount Plus. So yeah, wow. it's it's a. And, it's, and, and what do you bring to uh, you know those type of shoots when you're doing the you know the eight second cowboy rodeo and really getting into like the heart and core of of that personality and then you are working with a like hollywood actor and you have you know it's just it's such a different mindset how do you like jump from one to the other that's what i always that's one thing i always loved it's like when i first came to the us from a very small market, Switzerland, where photographers are expected to do a lot of different things and wear a lot of different hats. When I first showed my book in New York, everybody was like, okay, you need to decide. Like, are you gonna do still life or reportage or portraits? If you do portraits, do you are you just gonna do studio portraits or are you just gonna do um, documentary portraits, storytelling? And I say, okay, I definitely know that I want to do portraits, but I find it really hard to decide if I want to do one or the other because there are different aspects I like in each one. I like the honing the light and crafting everything. And I also like the reacting to something that is presented to me and, and going with the flow and diving into somebody else's world. So the switching between cowboy dirt and Hollywood stages, that's that's my balance, really. I love it. I love wearing those different hats. And that's really its own rodeo as well. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> For anyone that's done the Hollywood shoots, it is it is a rodeo. It is really a rodeo, yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I've done, I've, I've lasted eight seconds, though. I want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes you only get eight seconds with the talent. Exactly, oh. exactly. Uh, so coming back to a little bit about your journey, what would you say, if there was one, it has been the biggest challenge for you over the course of your career from the queen video in high school up until April 22nd, when the day we're recording this 2024. Biggest challenge I want to say was moving to New York at 34 years old with $2,000 to my name and no contacts whatsoever. And it was mid of January. It was really cold and gray, the, the worst time of the year. And after having, you know, worked as a photographer full time um, for a number of years, I went back to square one and I started building contacts of who can I assist? What's going to pay my rent? You know? And looking back, I have no idea how I <laughs> survived it. I don't know how I paid. Yeah, no, New York is hard. Rent. New York is really hard. <laughs> it is really hard, and there were a lot of you know teary nights and and loneliness, and never a question though whether I should go back. I remember um, when my friends dropped me off at the airport in Switzerland. One of them said, "You know, if it doesn't work out, you can always come back." Like, just keep that door open. And I always got mad at her because I was like, I know this is what I'm supposed to do. I know this is my way. Like, there's no turning back. But it was still hard. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, or we're going to ask you, like, a piece of advice later. But I do want to say, like, for people that are either feel like they are struggling or aren't willing to put in the work, what would you say? Because that's, you know, you said at 34 years old, starting back at square one, I'm sure you were a primary on a lot of projects already. And now going back to assisting, like, what would you say for people? Like, if they're not feeling like they want to start back at square one, That's what advice question. would you give those people? That's hard. Any, okay. Anybody, that, all the people that are under 30, just know that there is a good chance that you have to humble yourself. But yes, go ahead, Sally. Stay 
I stay humble and do put in the work. <laughs> I I totally get it when you are um when you already established something and you don't want to go back to square one. That's a really hard decision, and it also I know that I had a very privileged situation there. That I don't I don't have children. I never wanted children. I only had myself to um, you know take care of and. I didn't have any kind of debt because, you know, college education in Europe is not, does not cost an arm and a leg like it does here. So I didn't have any student loans or anything. Um, and I very much understand that there are people out there who don't have the privilege to start from square one. Um, I want to say to those people, keep something that pays the bills and do the side hustle because that's while I did start in, on square one when I was assisting the the further I grew into it and the, the more I got my own jobs I was working almost full time with this one photographer but I still had my own business and my own jobs to tend to and sometimes I would go um you know, I would assist on the morning shoot and then have my own editorial portrait scheduled for 2 p.m. And I would just pray to the the lords above that we would end on time so I wouldn't be late to my own um, to my own shoot where I would, you know, go to my own shoot straight from the airport coming home from another job. And it's it's tough. It's tough when you are trying to build your own business while you work for somebody else who is, you know, who has a very demanding schedule. And it's a lot of sleepless nights, but it's worth it. I'm going to ask you a question. And this is the question that I would ask those same people who didn't want to go back to square one is how bad did you want it? I, well, there's a for me it was not a knowing how bad i want it it was a knowing that there is no other way that that is my path period like yeah. just like when i applied for art school in, in switzerland i didn't have a plan b i don't have a plan b you know i know this is my path yeah so that I reminds do me everything of, uh... in my sorry i do yeah, everything no, no, no. in my power yeah it reminds me of an interview i think it was with oprah will smith had and they asked him, like, you know, what if this didn't work out? If acting didn't work out? He's like, there was no plan B. Like, yeah. This oh, is yeah. It. This is yeah. it. And He's so right. That, yeah. So it's almost like that's what I um, also tell people about is like having a plan B can be good and bad. Because if you have a plan B, that often will hold you back from plan A because you always know mm -hmm. you can fall back onto plan B. Yeah. Um, but know that you do whatever, it's different than knowing you'll do whatever it takes to make plan A happen. So it's a, just a shift. You may have to do the same exact things, but it's just a shift in thinking about plan B means, oh, I'm falling back and this is what I have to do. Doing whatever yeah. I need to do is now I take a job with somebody else. Yes. Yeah, it's a job for someone else, but it's helping me unlock my own business, build my business, and that's yeah. ultimately what I'm... And so when I asked the how bad do you want it, that's the premise of that question is, your plan B was never your final destination. And some people, unfortunately, their plan B turns out to be their final destination. Yeah. You weren't willing to settle because you wanted your own business. That's um when I first moved to New York, a lot of my a lot of my friends say, Well, why don't you take a job in a restaurant or work as a barista somewhere just to make ends meet? And I was like, if I do that, then I don't have the pressure to make it in photography. I want to have that. Yeah, I might, you know, it might hurt for a long while, but ultimately I'll have more drive if I have to make it with the money that I make in photography, no matter what I do, you know? Absolutely. Okay. And no offense to any baristas, servers. Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. Because, <laughs> uh, that you know, that that's the new, isn't that the New York story? Yes, you go is. there to be a dancer, photographer, so like Broadway, and you end up working in a coffee just like shop. you go to LA to become an actor, and it's, you gotta have a, a photographer sport. You can and have everything work out handed for everybody. To you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, going back, I do want to ask the question. So, 
what is the biggest piece of advice you would give to maybe not even someone now, but what, what would you tell your younger self knowing everything that you know now? What would I tell my younger self? Go to therapy earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I think that for me, that stalled my um, that stalled my start a little bit, to be honest. I see so many uh, people who, you know, grew up in in or around New York who um, or here in, in California who went to Brooks, um, who are already in that in that industry and who do incredible work at in their early 20s. And, you know, in my early 20s, I was still getting some stuff out of my system that I needed to get out of, get out of it. So um, I want to say to my younger self, every little step that you take is still a step. So just whatever you do, don't pause. And if you, you know, it doesn't have to be big, but if you want to, you know, journal journal two sentences if you can't get out more but it's still progress if you want to take one photo a week or one photo a day whatever it is do it you know that's great advice and i there's something that re reminded me of another conversation i was having as you were speaking and the theme of opportunity and also innovation is what i've been getting from this conversation is that right now because you said there's some people in their 20s doing brilliant work. I think right now is the golden era of creativity. And that can be, people can disagree with that. But the reason why I feel that is because everybody has access now, yeah. right? So like there's so many tools that make creativity easier, some for good, some for bad. But if you're really willing to learn and refine your craft, you can go to YouTube. You can go to like, there's so yeah. many like online tutorials tools are accessible now they're web-based like you don't need to have all these other things right like even when i was in high school i had to edit with like two vcrs because yeah i didn't have like a reel-to-reel -reel machine oh, yeah. whatever, right <laughs> yeah. um but now kids can like download an app on their phone and edit mm -hmm. like full length like video and av so that's and what that's i mean the... yeah go ahead, go ahead. That's the that's the technical part, right? You can learn anything of a YouTube or masterclass or creative life, whatever the websites are, right? Um, but you can also connect to other people so much easier. Like when I was in my twenties, it was, you know, it was barely the start of the internet for me, and there were no forums like that where it wasn't easy to find. And now you have all these amazing, you know, communities that offer advice and exchange and collaboration. And that's something that is, you know, really a positive in that for sure. Yeah. And shout out to Reed, who I interviewed last year. Um, to your point about access, like use people like us, LinkedIn, yes. right? Like it, now like younger generations have so much more access. If they want to, if you want to LinkedIn message your favorite director, do it. <laughs> right if you want to find them on social media and instagram and send them a dm do it right like you have so much more access now than we did growing up where like you had a pager and what are the odds of us finding pager. Someone, <laughs> pager number right like are you gonna find francis ford coppola's pager number somewhere probably not. <laughs> are you gonna write them a letter like a snail mail letter because you found their address probably not so yeah. the access the training the collaboration ability to collaborate all that stuff that's that all of these things are why i feel like right now is a golden era of creativity and uh as someone on the go uh what's your go-to camera ha my go-to camera so i used to start off on the cnars on the four by five which is no longer my go-to um I had a Mamiya RZ 67 for a very long time. And then I switched to a digital Hasselblad 31 million. Um, and by now I shoot on Sony and I love it. Nice. So if you're, if you did give someone like, what if they wanted to look for their first camera, that's not like point and shoot, like what would, what's a good camera for someone who wants to get into photography? Cause I'm still using the ones that you do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> and then you just like, like, <laughs> Kodak, a Leonard's like, I'm still using this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you you know, only get best... 12 shots and they got to be good. Yeah. <laughs> the best camera is the one that you carry with you, right? So yeah. if it's your phone, that's a good camera. It might not be something that you might be able to sell, although, you know, the number of years ago, the New York Times printed an iPhone picture on page one, right? And then you see all the the Apple commercials that are shot on an iPhone, right? Yeah. So that's really good. I want to say, well, the Sony that I should, it's so much more affordable these days, right? Back in the day, or just a number of years ago, you had to spend $30,000 for a Hasselblad body and then eight to $10,000 per lens that you wanted to own. And by now, the kids are down to probably around five grand um, yeah. that shoot really good. You know, I use my Sony both for the rodeo. Um, it's really good and high ISO, but it's at the same time, it has 61 megapixels and the files are beautiful and crisp. And if you have good lenses, there's so much quality, right? And I understand that five grand is still a lot of money, so you might want to. Um, I don't know all the it's models. It's not thirty but... grand. That's for <laughs> yeah. Sure. No, it, exactly. Even, yeah, yeah, it's not thirty grand, and which would you know, to be, yes. The Sony is probably a good place to start if you're looking. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say. Um, I have one more fun question to ask. Uh. Do you have a hobby that people who don't know you might be shocked to find out? <laughs> shocked? I don't know. Shocked. Um, I've been doing karate for the last seven years. Look at that um, New Yorker right there doing karate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the New York streets. You still yeah. gotta be careful. Yeah. Head on a swivel, right? Yeah. Um, but the Ninja that... Turtles wears off. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I get my sigh out, you know? Yeah. Eating a pizza and doing karate. Thanks. Sally. That's me. That's me. Yeah. If you see that, yeah. Come walk up to me. Nice. And, <laughs> um, and... No, it's, it's what I like about it. And I, um, that's another piece of the advice that I would like to give to people is find something, find a physical outlet that involves body and mind. Like, yeah. I could not run on a treadmill because my mind would go wherever I don't want it to go. But when I practice karate and I do my kata, it's a choreography and I, and everything is involved and I shut down the entire world outside of what I need to do right here, right now. And that is a mindset that I can go back to on set. Like when I'm, when I'm on a key art shoot, when it's like, five minute call for talent, I usually go off to a dark corner and I do one of my katas just to center myself. And it, yeah. it it's really good for me. It works, you know? Yeah. Nice. That yeah. my, that's a great of a mind, mind and body. Yeah. Yeah. Cause right. we get locked into these little rectangles for so yeah, long, you know, yeah, we, do. we forget yeah. that you got to actually do something physical. It's not just enough to like, listen, the music is great, but like, your body's just going to melt into the chair. Yes, exactly. After, do something that longer. requires gotta, yeah. you to. After this call, I'm going to take a walk. But yes. <laughs> I was going to go lap swimming next. <laughs> nice. Um, so where, where can people find you? Like, we'll put all the links into the show notes. But if people want to work with you, if people want to contact you, what's the best way for people to find you? Well, and my your website work? is sallymontana.com. And my email is on there, info at sallymontana.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, Sally Montana. You can find me on Instagram, Sally Montana underscore photo. And I want to say email is the best. I see emails pretty immediately. Whereas if you DM me on Instagram, it lands in the requests folder, which I don't check every day. And then it might just be delayed. So to all the people who prefer DMs on Instagram, please send me an email instead. Yeah. Or send a raven. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> or write a letter Ow. like we talked about before. Find my pager yeah. number. Yeah. <laughs> As you're driving in the truck, and then a raven's just like trying to catch up to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it takes chutzpah to be creative, and you are definitely have tons and tons of chutzpah. And no one should mess with you, definitely, if they weren't already before. 
not today, that's for sure. And uh, thanks for sticking with the, the the rodeo theme in every walks of life that you're doing, just with all your business ventures and and traveling. And I know the travel is such a big part of you, who what makes you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was truly a joy being here and a, a fun conversation. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, super fun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for listening. Um, thank you, Sally, again for joining us. This is Rico Nassol, Leonard Samuel signing off. Thanks for joining us for Creative Chutzpah. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching Creative Chutzpah. Hope you enjoyed it. I think you did. I saw a few smiles over there. All right. And make sure you turn into Rico Nizal's Creative Leadership with Heart. All right. He's pretty good. Okay. Give him a chance too. All right. And uh, we'll see you next time. And make sure you notch on something. You're too skinny. You're too skinny. Get out there and eat. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>